This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of November 15th, 2021. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss why a recent op-ed by Senator Rob Myers reminds us a lot of Governor Hammond's themes behind the PFD. Second, we explain our frustration with the bill that House Ways and Means appears to be readying for a strong push next session. And third, we discuss some more good news about the PICA project. And now, let's join Michael. So uh, let's talk about the weekly top three. We're going to start off with this uh, piece uh, that uh, Rob uh, Rob Myers wrote talking about uh, maybe now is the time to make some fundamental changes to the state of Alaska. If they're not going to treat us, uh, you know, properly according to what the, you know, what the founders and framers intended, maybe we should go back and revisit that. What? Uh, so give us a give us the rundown here. Well, I've been reading a lot of, uh, rereading a lot of uh, Governor Hammond uh, lately. I've been in a couple of debates that uh, have sort of uh, benefited from going back to the fundamentals and sort of restarting from the fundamentals. And in the midst of that, I uh, uh, I came across Rob's, uh, uh, Senator Myers' uh, piece uh, and found a lot of similarities uh, to what I'd been reading uh, with Governor Hammond. Basically, it is... Uh, Alaska started out as a, as a socialist state uh, in terms of its resources. The resources were granted to the state under the Statehood Act. The state cannot sell those resources, uh, cannot sell its mineral rights, uh, or if they try to, the, uh, the second before the mineral rights would go to the purchaser, they, they revert back to the federal government. So uh, the state has them. And Governor Hammond, uh, I think, uh, as we've talked about on the show a lot of times, uh, was a genius in how he dealt with that. He, uh, he looked at a situation that was, that was socialist, where the resources went to the state and figured out through the permanent fund uh, dividend, uh, ultimately, uh, how to distribute uh, a share of those resources back to, uh, back to citizens in much the same way that, uh, that you find in the lower 48. I mean, when I was a lawyer in Oklahoma, Texas, Louisiana, Arkansas, New Mexico, uh, I dealt a lot with uh, royalty owner rights, uh, individual royalty owner rights. And there's lots of studies that talk about uh, the significance of, of the royalty owners, of, the, of that royalty income to private individuals, uh, the importance of that to the economies of the, of the various states and how, how that private capital, the creation of that private capital through uh, royalties uh, uh, has benefited, greatly benefited, uh, the oil uh, producing states. So we had a situation in Alaska where we didn't have that because the, the, uh, uh, the, the revenues, uh, the, ro- the mineral interest, the revenues from the mineral interest went to the state. Uh, Governor Hammond figured out a way to deal with that through uh, the permanent fund dividend. Rob's uh, article, I think, is a Rob's op-ed, is a, is a very good sort of, let's go back to fundamentals uh, article about, uh, you know, what are we doing? As, as the PFD is cut, as as a portion of the of the PFD is diverted or taxed or uh, it, whatever whatever characterization you want to put on it and diverted to government, uh, um, we're going back to the socialist system that uh, that Governor Hammond tried to take us away from, uh, and and going 
going away from the system that you find in the lower 48 that that the studies have said uh, have really benefited uh, the lower 48 right. economies. Um, so it's a it's a it's a it's a wonderful piece for those who haven't read Hammond. Uh, you can sort of read Myers uh, and and understand the gist of uh, of what Hammond was saying. Um, or you, if for those of you who have read Hammond, uh, Governor Hammond's uh, uh, the best books are Diapering the Devil and uh, uh, Bushrat Governor. There's there's chapters in Bushrat Governor that uh, are really uh, uh, very critical in, in terms of outlining what he was, what his thinking was on this. For those of you who have read those, read those books or Hammond's speeches or his speech at the 2004 conference of Alaskans, um, you, you will see the similarities between that and, uh, and Rob's article. And I, and I think it's a very, very useful piece. There's one thing missing, uh, again, I've, as I've been rereading Hammond, uh, uh, it, uh, it, it's been on my mind. Uh, Governor Hammond's plan was really a twofold plan. One was to distribute uh, what was state wealth, what, what, what the federal government had created as state wealth, uh, um, royalty wealth, distribute that to uh, a portion of it uh, to uh, individuals. And the second was, uh, the second piece uh, of Governor Hammond's plan was uh, to retain uh, an income tax, not necessarily to have it uh, tax not to not to have it effective, but as he as he put it as a sword of Damocles over uh, over the legislature's head, uh, so that if they spent too much, uh, that income tax would kick in. Uh, and as he put it, there's nothing that uh, that uh, uh, better uh, uh, concentrates the mind of legislators than to have constituents uh, coming after them uh, uh, as a result of uh, of increased taxes. So that sort of that income tax sort of as a sort of Damocles would sit over the legislature and say, if you spend too much, then we're going to kick in the income tax, and then you're going to have uh, constituents coming after us. Uh, right. I think that I think that is an equal uh, uh, part of Governor Hammond's vision of how to keep uh, spending down. Hammond said Hammond said uh, in uh, in both Bushrat Governor or, and in uh, uh, Diapering the Devil. That if you don't have the income tax, if you don't have that sort of Damocles hanging hanging over the legislature's head, uh, that at some point the legislature will just keep spending and spending and spending, and at some point they'll put the PFD at risk. Uh, and guess what's happened to us uh, it, it, in the subs in the subsequent period? Right. It, I, I mean, I get I get into these debates and people say, well, you're 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 arguing for an income tax. Governor Hammond argued for having the income tax sit there in suspension, ready to go. If the legislature spent too much, he actually right. didn't argue for an income tax to fund government. It was to have that sort of Damocles, or as he once put it, Damoclean uh, uh, income tax sitting over uh, over right. the legislature. Well, his uh, argument so came. His argument. Came, I think that's his argument came about the time when they were talking about eliminating it, and his argument was, no, 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 just turn it to zero percent and have it kick in, like you said when government starts to overspend so that it would activate the people at that point, that it would remain on the books right. and be at 0% right. Right. until a certain level, and then it would be kind of the tripwire, and it would, it would force people to engage, to say all of a sudden, well, it's been zero, but now, guess what? Now it's 1% or 2% or whatever, and that's when people would get active and get engaged. Yeah, and Hammond, Hammond was, I, I mean, going back and reading Hammond is like, I, I have several aha moments as I, as I, as I do that. Uh, you know, he, he was, he was brilliant. He said, look, if, if you, if you rely on the PFD, essentially said, if you rely on the PFD for government, uh, you're going to be taking from middle and lower income Alaska families. Uh, and you're not going to be activating the, uh, uh, the top 20%. On the other hand, if you have this, this Damoclean income tax setting over people's heads, that will activate the top 20%. It'll activate all Alaskans, including the top 20% uh, in pushing back on increased spending because they're the ones who will be uh, uh, suffering the burden uh, from it. So I, to go back to fundamentals, Rob's piece is, I think, a very important piece. It's a, it's a reminder. He doesn't mention Governor Hammond in it, uh, uh, probably because he was being modest, but... Brad? No. Hammond was confronting and 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 his resolution of them. Sorry, we lost you there for a hot second. So, yeah, no, I mean, I agree with you. And, and the irony of this whole thing is that this is what Hammond was trying to avoid 
the whole time. I mean, with the, with the genesis of the permanent fund and the genesis of the uh, 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 the genesis of the permanent fund and the permanent fund dividend was all about it was all because Hammond came out and was just wildly worried. Uh, about the spending of government of politicians because they went through that first nine hundred million dollar payment like you know something through a goose you know what I mean I mean it just went like it was zoom that year the budget was one hundred and sixty million dollars for the entire state and they went through nine hundred million dollars in a matter of months and that was that was kind of like a shocking eye opener it'd be like us today getting a windfall of of uh, of you know of uh, of like forty or fifty billion dollars and spending it all in a wild spending spree in just a few months, that's what he was worried about. Well, and, and he was worried about the the, the buildup of government. I mean, he was worried about uh, 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 things uh, uh, getting out of hand. So I, over time, so I it, it was just I mean his his he understood Alaska in a way that I'm not sure many have understood it uh, uh, since uh, in terms of how the economy works, how the, how the, how the oil revenues work, how uh, things work uh, uh, together. Um, and it's just, uh, I mean, I, going back and rereading his stuff just really brings back to mind uh, 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 how, you know, insightful he was about the Alaska economy. Uh, and about the interplay between government and the economy and the importance of of private sector uh, income uh, from from the oil wealth. Um, and Rob's piece, uh, Rob's piece is just absolutely in that vein. I, he's gotten criticized. I mean, Dermot Cole, uh, <laughs> which may be a mark of honor, uh, <laughs> criticized it uh, for, uh, you know, not being not not being true to history. And and basically what, what Dermot was doing is he was taking Rob literally. He was taking the headline or some piece in, in the piece and saying Rob was saying, well, we ought to we ought to, you know, give the permanent fund back to the private sector or we ought to give uh, uh, we ought to give uh, 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 the mineral interest back to the private sector. That's not what Rob was saying. What Rob was saying was the same thing that that uh, that Governor Hammond says in terms of, uh, of we ought to. Make sure, just like in the lower 48, that a portion of the mineral wealth goes uh, goes into the private sector and stimulates the private sector in the same way that uh, that it does in the lower 48. Carol's talking about oil again, and we've I think Brad and I have agreed that yes, there's still room in the oil patch to uh, to pull a little money out of that uh, uh, to pull a little money out of the oil industry as well. I mean, everybody. I think that's what Mike Shower was talking about. You know, 200 million, 300 million from the oil companies, a little bit of the South Dakota model of the sales tax, or some cuts. I mean, there was a it was kind of an all-in plan that was part of the what the uh, fiscal policy working group was talking about, Brad. Well, there's uh, the fiscal policy working group is sort of nebulous on what new revenues they're talking about. Uh, how soon they forget. I mean, I, I took a lot of flack from friends for supporting ballot measure one, which was the oil industry tax uh, change this last uh, election cycle. And now I'm taking flack for not being, you know, not pushing, not pushing oil taxes uh, enough. It's um, uh, there, there is some, some money there. I, I'm not a big fan of the South Dakota or the Wyoming sales tax. They're both regressive. Uh, uh, in, in, in a significant uh, way, uh, not to the same extent as PFD cuts, but they're nevertheless regressive. Take more from middle and lower income Alaska families than from, uh, than from uh, the top 20%. So I think there are better ways to raise that segment of revenues, but, it's, but it, it is a, 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 a general, I mean, the working group recognized a general need for revenues. They put it at uh, maybe $500 million, I think, a half a billion dollars in uh, in uh, revenues as part of their compromise, um, and, but they weren't specific. It could come from a variety of sources, certainly including uh, oil revenues. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Um, I mean, one point two billion dollars is the number that gets thrown around a lot. Uh, I know. I think Willikowski and some others have talked about that. But that's. Uh, I don't. I mean, I don't think that there's that much money left <laughs> on the taxation side of the world. I think you, you and I have discussed that in the past. Oh, it's a 1.2 billion dollars if you entirely eliminate uh, the the revenue adjustments that are called credits uh, in uh, in 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 the tax regime. If you entirely wipe those out, so that you're charging the same 
Uh, you're taking the same percentage of oils at forty dollars as you are of oils at uh, at a hundred dollars. Uh, those credits are in there to create a progressive uh, tax system uh, across price. Uh, and that one point two dollars is if you wipe wipe all those credits out. But what you do if you did that is you would wipe out, uh, frankly, the incentives for additional investment. So we would just basically you go into harvest mode at that uh, at that point. And I'm not sure we're there uh, uh, as Alaska yet. I, I, there's certainly Conoco is trying to invest more uh, in the Willow project. Uh, Pika is the other big project we've got out there. We're going to talk about it again in the third segment. Uh, but I'm not sure we're there in terms of uh, in terms of harvest mode and just wiping out uh, uh, the incentives uh, uh, for the oil industry to continue to invest. Yeah, which is a, one of the things we're going to hit in part three here as we come back to this. We'll uh, we'll discuss it. Don in the chat room says the South Dakota tax supports a government that spends one third of what Alaska spends per capita. So I think it's a difference of scale at that point as well. I mean, you know, for sure. No, it raises revenue. I mean, I, it, yes, South Dakota sales tax raises revenue. But the question is who it raises it from. Uh, and if you look at the uh, distributional uh, uh, analysis of the South Dakota tax, which ITEP has done, uh, it's uh, it's hugely regressive. Uh, not to the same extent as the permanent fund uh, uh, permanent fund cuts, but it's uh, it's regressive. It takes more from middle and lower income Alaska families. So, if you if you believe that that's a problem, and I do, because that's uh, that sort of regressive tax flows through and adversely affects the economy. If you believe that a regressive tax is, is problematic, the South Dakota tax doesn't really uh, uh, doesn't really get you where you want to be in terms of uh, evening the playing field. All right, Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. That wraps up number one. We can give me a quick tease on number two, Brad, which is the Fiscal Policy Working Group did not have, I mean, they had they had a pretty clear vision for a group of such diverse people. I mean, they actually came out with better proposals. And the longer that I look at it and the longer that I look go back to it, I realize how amazing it was that they came out together and basically agreed to all this. But there's a few things that they definitely were not talking about that now people are, I guess, seeing and reading into things. Uh, give us a quick tease on number two. Well, there's a piece in the Fairbanks News Miner uh, by their po new political reporter, Linda Hersey, that uh, talks about uh, a hearing that uh, House Ways and Means had at the end of the uh, for special session, and and it's a it's a bill. They're setting up a bill that was going to be their big bill, I think, uh, when they uh, come back uh, uh, from uh, uh, come back into regular session. It's going to be the bill that Ways and Means pushes, um, and it's not. I mean, so we went through this whole thing with the working group. We went through with all the effort of the working group to put it together. Uh, a, a lot of meetings, a lot, of, a lot of compromises. You can see it in the document uh, to 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 create a path for the legislature to go down uh, on uh, uh, on on how to resolve this conflict. They had the most conservative, the most liberals, uh, the most liberal uh, representatives all working on it. Uh, came to a compromise document, and and the House Ways and Means uh, bill is nothing uh, like uh, like what uh, like what the working group did. So it's. I mean, it's 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 like you know, here's the solution. Here's what you know, eight of us plus uh, plus four, twelve of us uh, came to as a solution. A fifth of the legislature came to as a solution. Here's the guide path, and House Ways and Means went. Nah, we don't like that. We're going off on, on a different direction. So we're going to talk about what House Ways and Means is doing. So the Fiscal Policy Working Group had one vision of the future. Of course, uh, that wasn't picked up by the rest of the legislature for most of the legislative session. And in fact. The uh, Way to Be Mean Committee, I mean the Ways and Means Committee, uh, was uh, diving into their whole idea here. Uh, they had different viewpoints. Brad, uh, you want to talk a bit about that? And, of course, I think this falls right back into that discussion uh, that we had a couple weeks ago when, when, uh, when it looked like the revenue forecast was going to show we were actually going to have a windfall. And immediately what happened was different legislators and Nils Andreessen and others basically found all these great things that they wanted to spend the money on. Uh, which, uh, again, uh, totally throws everything that the Fiscal Policy Working Group did out the door. Uh, let's talk about that. So Ways and Means has been working on, uh, over the course of the last uh, session, regular session, and over the course of the various special sessions, Ways and Means has been working on their bill uh, to bring to the to the legislature as their solution to uh, 
uh, uh, to solve the uh, uh, solve the fiscal situation going forward. Um, and Ways and Means was set up to do just that. It was set up to to you know examine a variety of uh, of, of, of proposals and uh, and come up with a suggestion for the House at least uh, for the House to take up in terms of uh, in terms of a way forward. And their ultimate bill uh, the, that that's come out of the that they were the, that's the sort of the result of this whole process uh, through the regular and the special sessions. Their ultimate bill uh, is one that, uh, as I say, is the subject of an article good article. Well, we just Brad just locked up there, so we'll uh, we'll see if we can catch up with Brad here again real quick here before we go. You still with me, Brad? I'm. So there you go. There you go. I am. There am you, I? Okay. You, you, well, you, I'm sorry. Your, your audio locked up for a second there, so I'm sorry. Continue ahead. Anyway, it, so so the Ways and Means Bill is a uh, is a proposal to uh, uh, take the permanent fund, take the POMV, and instead of fifty fifty, which is something that was explicitly uh, included in the working group's uh, recommendation, to make that twenty five seventy five. Uh, 25 percent uh, uh, in the of the POMB draw goes to uh, the PFD. Uh, 75 percent would go to government. Uh, and within the government share, uh, the proposal is to to divide that 75 percent 50 50 between education uh, and government uh, to to dedicate designate because we can't dedicate under the constitution to designate 50 percent of that 75% that goes to government to education. And basically what that is, is an effort to try to get the education lobby uh, uh, activated to come in and support uh, that bill uh, because there's a designation of funds uh, in that bill uh, specifically for education. So the working group said, we need POMV 50-50. We want POMV 50-50, that's the compromise. Uh, we want to work toward a constitutionalization of POMB 5050. There are a lot of other things around that. We need additional revenues. We need additional spending cuts. Uh, but the, but one of the core principles in there that they agreed on specifically was POMB 5050. Um, and and the and the Ways and Means Committee that's supposed to be coming up with a with a bill that can get through the legislature and finally resolve uh, this uh, uh, the stalemates that we've had comes up and proposes 75 25 uh, and rather than that 70 rather than the portion going to government go to, go generally to government um, uh, they're they're splitting that in half and putting half of it over on education it's just a I, I don't I don't get what the legislature is doing to be very honest I don't get what ways and means is doing I mean the the purpose of the working group was to find a compromise between some of the most liberal some of the most conservative, uh, the, the four caucuses, the two caucuses in the Senate, the two caucuses in the House, um, uh, get everybody on board on one way forward. It, against the odds, it did that. Uh, and, and a lot of people are unhappy with very parts, various parts of it, but that probably proves it's a good compromise. Uh, against all the odds, it did that. Uh, and then, you know, the body that's supposed to be coming up with, with the overall solution just ignores it. <laughs> And, uh, and and goes in an entirely different direction. And I right. and I, I I mean I don't know how we're supposed to get to a solution to, of this thing. I don't even know how the legislature thinks it's supposed to get to a solution of this thing. If after setting up the working group, the next big committee that comes out that's supposed to be in charge of of developing a solution, the next big committee just ignores what the working group did. I it, it, we're, we're it's almost like people want this thing to continue to be stuck. And not find a solution to it, uh, or or you know ram their solution through by you know trying to trying to activate the education lobby and 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 have them help push it push it through. It's yeah, just we're we're not we're not getting to a solution. Wait, business as usual. I mean, isn't that what we've been saying this whole time? Is that there's a group out there that basically wants things to continue just the way that they've been continuing? I mean. It's the same kind of thing, and it, and it's the same kind of gamesmanship that we've talked about before. I mean, you med, you mentioned earlier, you made a Freudian slip, and you said dedicated. Oh no, no, it's designated because we can't have dedicate when it's a fra fractionally the same thing. I mean, at that point, what I mean, what to to quote a famous politician, what difference does it make at that point? Yeah, 
it's a uh, uh, it's just a a very disappointing uh, outcome. I uh, Dermot, go back to Dermot for a second. Uh, Dermot was complaining about this article because the the reporter uh, was talking about uh, the uh, the twenty five percent that is being put over to government as coming out of the permanent fund dividend. Dermot Dermot was arguing that it should be you know. Uh, should be cut should be described as coming out of the POMV draw out of the out of the permanent fund draw not out of the permanent fund dividend but you know maybe that's a Freudian slip by the by the reporter as well but it is coming out of the permanent fund dividend I mean from the from the standpoint of the working group from the standpoint of the current statute uh, uh, it's 50 50 the split is 50 50 between government uh, and uh, and 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 the legislature and 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 well between government and citizens Alaska residents and by by cutting that 50% in half by reducing that down to 25% you are taking it from the permanent fund dividend so it's um i just i, I it, it's just disappointing to see after all the effort and all the progress that the working group made all of the compromises that we made and you can see the compromises in there all the compromises that we made that the next legislative committee the legislative committee that's supposed to be producing the bill uh, for at least on the House side, that uh, that we take up when the legislature comes back has just uh, just ignored it. Well, and you could see. I mean, we we were worried about this. You know, we give compromise, and they see. You know, give them an inch, they think they're a ruler kind of thing. You know, we give the fifty fifty, and they're like, okay, great. So now we want seventy five twenty five. We've compromised. No, no, no. We we came. <laughs> Wait, we came to the middle on this thing. We were at full PM, full PFD plus full, full PFD payback, and now we compromise to say, okay, well, we'll we'll live with a 50-50 POMV, and they're like, okay, great, now we can compromise. No, wait a second, that's not how it works. I mean, but that's that's how they want it to work, and I think that the whole point here is that that, that it's all about retaining the power. Rob Rob Myers in the chat room says it's, they want to keep business as usual because that helps them retain the power. And here's another disappointing thing about that, Michael. There are two members of the working group on the House Ways and Means Committee. Calvin Schrage, uh, who was a who was a, a, a House Majority Representative on the uh, on the working group, and Mike Prox, who was a House Minority uh, Representative on the working group, were on the uh, alternative. He was an alter, alternate to the 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 House uh, uh, Minority members. Uh, were on the working group. They they participate in those those discussions. And, and here, two members of the of the uh, of the of the working group are, are on there, and here, you know, they're just completely disregarding. Uh, uh, no indication uh, that I can tell that either Shraggy or Prox raised the issue that uh, uh, the, the, what the what the House Ways and Means Committee was doing was inconsistent with the working group. So, you know, why did why did we go through the process if if it's just going to be tossed out? Good question, uh, but and there really no answers at this point other than business as usual. That seems to be the answer. So we're down to the last two and a half, three minutes here. You got more good news on Pika. It looks like uh, oil search uh, has gotten a little more rosy, but is it real is the question. <laughs> so oil search is in the process of being acquired by a company called Santos, which is an Australian, big Australian, uh, mostly natural gas company. Uh, that is looking at uh, combining with oil search, uh, particularly for oil, oil searches, uh, uh, LNG projects, gas projects in uh, Pow Pow New Guinea, uh, PNG. And, uh, and that's been the focus of, of why Santos has been after oil search. There recently, however, has been some indication from Santos's CEO, uh, the new, the, C, the person who will be the CEO of the combined entity once the merger is completed, uh, that they're interested in PICA, that Santos is interested in PICA. That's a first. Uh, at the time of the acquisition, Santos uh, really didn't have much to say about Pika. There were a lot of rumors that Santos would be interested in offloading the entire uh, oil search interest in Pika. We had a, you and I had a conversation about Conoco being a potential acquirer uh, of uh, of that interest. Uh, but now uh, the Santos has indicated some 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 uh, interest in it. It's a couple of things to be a little skeptical skeptical about. There's some opposition to, uh, to among oil searches uh, uh, stockholders to the Santos uh, acquisition, uh, and Santos is on a sales kick to try to convince the oil search uh, stockholders that uh, that they ought to come on board 
Some of that opposition is based upon the fact that they don't believe that PICA is being given the value it should be in the merger. Um, and Santos saying good things about it is a way of trying to ameliorate that concern. The other is that both Santos and Oil Search and uh, Repsol are trying to sell their interests in it. So you want to you want to be good saying good things about something when you're <laughs> selling a Wait, portion of their interest. You're saying it's a sales pitch, is what you're saying on the on the front end there. Yeah, a little bit, Brad. Uh, gotta hold, be a, don't, hold gotta be a little skeptical. Got to be a little skeptical. So you're saying this is kind of the perfect storm of all these different things where uh, they're trying to sell. Uh, certain parts of it, the oil search shareholders are reticent to let go because they don't feel like they're getting their value. This is Santos saying, oh, no, no, we really value you after all. And maybe things will happen. But I mean, who knows, right? Yeah, but you've got yes. And and so, you know, I, as I as I think I said in my note to you, I'm not yet convinced uh, uh, that uh, that that Pika has sort of, you know, uh, come back from uh, from the the shape it was in at one point in terms of getting financing, but in the last two weeks, <clears throat> excuse me, in the last two weeks, the Repsol CEO has gone out of his way to say good things about Pika. Uh, Repsol's a Spanish company. They're 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 focused on renewables. They're focused on the energy transition. Uh, you know, there's a they've spent a lot of time talking about the energy transition, but then in an interview he comes back and says good things about Pika, uh, and now you've got Santos, who's the who would be the Santos CEO, who would be the CEO of the combined oil search Santos side, uh, um, the 51% owner, Repsol is the 49% owner in the project. The, you got the Sa Santos chairman coming back and saying good things about it. So, you, you know, you, you've got to, you've got to give some weight to that. They're both, uh, the, the securities and both of them are regulated. Uh, uh, the, the companies are under the obligation to tell the truth. Uh, uh, and and not mislead shareholders. So you've got to give some weight to what those what those people are saying, um, and and that's that's a good sign for Pika. And and Pika is an important project to Alaska going forward. Going back to, you know, Harold's question about oil taxes. Uh, uh, if you're not, if, you want you want the oil companies to have some incentive to continue to invest. You want them to make money out of this project. You don't want to strip all the money out of it. And uh, and and taxes are are an important piece of of, of that of that equation so you you, you you've got some uh, uh, hope uh, from what Santos the, from what the CEOs of Santos and Repsol have said that you know peak has got to, has got some life to it there's reasons to be skeptical as I said they're both in sales mode Santos is in a double sales mode they're trying to sell you know the merger to the to the oil search shareholders who want who want to know that peak is valued. Um, and Repsol is trying to sell a piece, at least a piece of their project of, of their side of the project um, into the market. So you've got some reason to be a little skeptical about the statements. But as I said, they're securities regulated companies they are publicly held companies with their securities that are regulated with an obligation to tell the truth. And, uh, and so you've got to give uh, you got to give way to that. Long story short, uh, Pika has more life, I think, than uh, than, than what uh, I might have attributed to it uh, several months ago. Uh, after, especially after the Santos merger was announced and Santos uh, really wasn't saying good things about it. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. I mean, you say that, <clears throat> I have to laugh because you say they're regu their security is regulated, which means they have an obligation to tell the truth. It doesn't mean that companies that go through that are obviously always 100% forthcoming i mean you know they're mostly they're walking the line there right i mean they're finding they're finding ways to shine the pros without necessarily exposing the cons well yeah and and as i say they're both in sales mode for for slightly different purposes but they're they're both in uh, in sales mode so uh you know maybe maybe you know they're they're they're, they're telling you know the the all of the good story and 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 not really shading it a little bit as they might uh, as they might have uh, before, but look, this is a big project to us. Uh, you want to you want to uh, you want to have good stories told about it. You want to believe in it, uh, and uh, and they're saying things that uh, if they truly believed it was a trash project, uh, and it wasn't it wasn't going to investment from anybody. Uh, they they couldn't be saying these things. It wouldn't it wouldn't be consistent with their obligations under the regulations, uh, secure, under the securities regulations laws to be saying these things. So it's a, it's a good sign. And I and I, you know, I've 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 been negative on Pika enough that I need to recognize 
when there are uh, are good signs out there and uh, and and keep that in mind. Again, it's a big project. It's not it's not a Prudhoe, uh, but it's Caparic ish in terms of its uh, uh, in terms of its implications for uh, Alaska's uh, right uh, oil and oil and gas production down the road. So we we need to, it, 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 we need to be talking about it and we need to recognize. Uh, when there are bad things about it, and we need to be, and we need to recognize when there are good things about it. And in the last two weeks, we've had the CEOs of the two owners say good things about the project. We need to recognize that, right? And they did find too. There's two other d- new newer fields that are that are, uh, you know, stirring some of this hype, right? I mean, they've got two other pika size fields that they're looking at as well. So it's, uh, um, it. I mean, there's there's some there's some good stuff on the horizon potentially. <laughs> It, it, it's like Prudhoe. I mean, Prudhoe, you had the initial uh, initial uh, participating area, which was the big Prudhoe Reservoir, and then there were all sorts of different additional fields uh, that you found uh, around Prudhoe, Lisburn, Point McIntyre, uh, additional uh, uh, satellite fields that you found around it. And what we're finding with Pika is the same thing. There's the initial discovery, the initial participating area, and then we're starting to find these these additional fields uh, around it. So it's it's a good project. I mean, it's it's a it's a if if it can get funding, it's a good project. Question has always been about can it get funding, and uh, as I say, we have to recognize that the CEOs of the two partners are now uh, are now saying good things about it. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. As always, Brad, it's fun to talk, and I appreciate you coming on board. And we will uh, we'll uh, we'll continue this discussion next week. I'm sure it'll be same for second verse same as the first at this point but uh i figured if we continue to rail against those windmills eventually we won't get knocked off for sonante as we go through so yeah exactly right and 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 in terms of in terms of follow up if people haven't read rob myers's piece uh it's in most of the papers now it started out in uh must read, I think, and then uh, has has shown up in the ADN, Fairbanks News Miner, and others. If people haven't read Rob Myers' piece, go back and read it. Uh, for those of you who have read uh, uh, Hammond, uh, you'll see the similarities. Brad Keithley, thank you so much, my friend. It's good to have you. Appreciate you being on. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.